Hi, I'm Dr. Tommy Wood. This is The Greg Bennett Show. Any questions? Welcome to The Greg Bennett Show, presented by Any Question. I'm your host, Greg Bennett, and I have just finished another incredible episode with um, one of the most brilliant men I know, Dr. Tommy Wood. And in this episode, we, we really just break down the effects of exercise on the brain and then also the flip side of the brain and the effects on physiology. And I've always loved his, his quote of, you know, what you think directly impacts your physiology. And for me, as somebody that's always done a lot of visualization and word affirmations and everything else, I enjoy that part of the conversation. We finished the show talking about longevity. Um, I've had a number of mates tell me they want to live to 150 or, or more. And I asked asked him basically what does he think about that and does he think that's realistic and um, that was a fun conversation at the end of the show but there's a lot in this one like always Tommy just gives so much wonderful advice on on how we can improve cognitive function um, both in the short term and long term reduce the chances of dementia and Alzheimer's and and what we can do to to really train our brains Um, the big takeaway is we all got to dance we got to learn to dance and we got to learn to do different dances. So that's a big takeaway. I'll tell you that now in the intro, but this is just a really wonderful conversation. Uh, you can also find Dr. Tommy Wood on any question. Uh, he'll take your questions from this episode. He's over there in, in the healthcare space as one of the most brilliant people in the world that I've come to know. So he's over there to answer any follow-up questions you have for this episode or any other questions you have. You can also check out all the other experts we have over at any question go check them out um so many wonderful channels there so many wonderful experts to answer your questions i hope you enjoyed this episode as much as i did and remember success comes to those who endure just one moment longer all right today i am joined by one of my favorite guests he's been on the show several times. And if you haven't listened to these episodes, you really got to go back and listen to him because he's just one of the most brilliant people I know. Um, A quick recap of his background. He's received his bachelor's degree in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge, a medical degree from the University of Oxford, and a PhD in physiology and neuroscience from the University of Oslo. I tell you, I never get tired of reading that out. It's just such an impressive resume. He's currently the assistant professor of pediatrics and and neuroscience at the University of Washington. And his research program focuses on everything to do with brain health and the function across lifespan. And it's just fascinating topics. And I want to dive into that a little bit more in this episode. And add to that, he also competes as a power lifter and strong man and CrossFit and everything else. And so he truly understands the benefits of physical activity and, and how that can impact his metabolic health been a good mate of mine for for quite some time and and i i personally use him as just a great resource so um really appreciating coming on so welcome and thanks for joining me on the greg bennett show once again dr tommy wood how are you mate i'm good thanks uh and thanks for having me back i always in, in enjoy our chats both uh in the in the podcast and outside the podcast so i'm really really happy to be here yeah no i appreciate it man that's pretty i mean i'm on east coast u.s time and you're in washington so did i get you out of bed pretty early in this morning were you able to get your morning routine in or oh yeah so the the dogs usually get up around so it's just after eight o'clock my time dogs usually get up around six yeah. um and that's when i'll i have you know, a little routine of take them outside, make a nice cup of coffee and all that kind of stuff. So I, so I usually start work sometime between seven and eight. So we're, you know, we're right on schedule. Gotcha. Did, did, you, did you work out in the mornings or you work out later? I work out in the afternoons. Uh, um, is there a metabolic I, I, reason? Is, there, is that something we should all be doing? Hang on. Um, <laughs> no, no. So, I mean, there are like a lot of people have kind of looked at various studies of when to exercise during the day. And, and the most important thing is like, when's the time that fits into your schedule such that you can make it a habit. That's, that's the most mm. important thing. And you'll start to then perform better at the time that you normally exercise. Yeah. Um, however, in the afternoon, like I just feel a lot warmer and stronger yeah. and there are some like data to support that as well. So like first thing out of bed, I, you know, I, I don't always feel like ready to go and mm. rip some heavy weights off the floor. So I, I generally just feel, um, feel better 
uh, in, in the afternoon. So yeah. that, that's when I tend to go to the gym. It's, it's funny you mentioned those couple of things. It's, it's like I've always seen myself as a morning person. Um, so I just get up and do it and do my routine. And to the point when I was a professional athlete, I'd do five or six hours straight in the morning. Mm-hmm. And then I was training with a guy by the name of Javier Gomez. And in the sport of triathlon, the guy's like won more races than anybody, um, nine-time world champion, everything else. And we were training in Noosa, Australia. And he always would do sort of his easy work in the morning and then set his afternoon for when he really wanted to lay, you know, lay something down. Yeah. And I did that a little bit with him. I've got to tell you, like you said, you feel so warmed up and ready to go in the afternoon. I performed way better, but it just doesn't work in with the way I kind of work. Like I'm not going to be as consistent on the afternoon. So, but it is, it is an area that I'd, I'd like to, if I could do more afternoon workouts, but, um, mate, while I got you, maybe if you could just give us a quick recap, because I know you've been on this show a couple of times and, and, and most of our listeners have, have already heard you, but quick recap into basically why your interest in brain health and where did that all begin? I'm a neuroscientist by profession. That's kind of, you know, if somebody had to ask me what I do, I, you know, I'd say I'm a neuroscientist, but mm. I kind of fell into it. Mm. Like it, it just sort of almost happened at, at random. I guess it started when I, when I was an undergrad I got this um, this sort of scholarship for during one of my summers that basically just uh, gave me some money so I could work in a lab and just get some experience of, of research um, mm. early on. And nowadays, if you're an undergrad at university, you're probably going to be doing that. It, it's sort of become part of the norm. Whereas back then, you know, if you're if you're an undergrad, all you're doing is sitting in lectures and writing essays, and mm. that's it. Um, you're, not, you're not sort of really participating in, in active research. So I did that for a summer and it was in a lab um, at the University of Bristol in neonatal neuroscience. So looking at ways to treat the injured newborn brain, which is mm. what I now do for, for most of my uh, job in the lab. So I did that for a couple of summers and then went to medical school, worked as a junior doctor for a couple of years. And then uh, the professor who runs that lab, we, we met up. And we just sort of happened to, to see each other. And she said, I've just moved back to Norway. She's Norwegian. Mm. And uh, why don't you come to Norway and do a PhD? And I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds interesting. <laughs> I didn't really know. Didn't, still wasn't sure what I want, what kind of doctor I wanted to be when I grew up. I hadn't finished my training yet. So I thought, you know, why don't I d- delay that decision by going and do a PhD? Um, and so that's essentially what I did. Mm. And during that time, um, as you know, maybe listeners already know, I, I I spent more time working uh, with sort of athletes. I started a bit of a podcast, um, mm. you know, a blog, just looking at various aspects of health and performance, which is something that had sort of interested me throughout undergrad and, and um, med school. I was a rower and then I was a, a coach for rowing, but also a fitness coach for the medical school football team and, uh, you know, various other things. I, I ran a circuit training class for medical students for a couple of years. So then those things kind of happened in parallel during my PhD. I was, you know, sort of building this small online presence with some thoughts about health and performance whilst doing this sort of basic neuroscience. And mm-hmm. then that's kind of progressed over time. So I've, uh, you know, gone into, you know, I've worked as a performance consultant for a lot of professional athletes in various sports and then also continued my academic career in neuroscience. And now, you know, I still do the neonatal neuroscience, but I also do some traumatic brain injury work. I do some, uh, uh, Alzheimer's and dementia work. Mm, mm. And in reality, those sort of streams have kind of come together, which is, you know, looking at how can we keep the brain and body, which are intimately connected and influence one another, and what's good for the body is usually good for the brain. Um, how can we keep both of those things in optimal health for as long as possible like throughout the entire lifespan? Um, and how can we intervene? When can we intervene? What I like about trying to tie those things together is the fact that the it, the same things are always important, regardless of when you look in your across your lifespan, mm. and you can all almost always intervene and change the trajectory of of your health, uh, both of your body and your brain. So, like nothing is ever fixed, and you know nothing is ever a lost cause, mm. except for like maybe right at the end of, of life, um, like right, like right at the right at the sharp end. Uh, but before then, you have decades where you can, you can actively intervene uh, and change things. You can um, change things around, even if you've abused exactly. yourself for, for decades. <laughs> There's still yeah. hope. There's still hope. I feel like I abused myself physio- physiologically. Ugh. 
tongue twist um, over over you know a span of thirty years in sport, and maybe I overtrained. And I want to dive into that. that. This is really what I want this episode to be about. Is is exactly what you just described. Um, you know how our physical performance can affect our brain. And then on the flip side of that, how our brain can affect our physiology, which is also mm. one of my favorite topics to have with you. So um, let's dive right in. And so on that, you know, have you found that there's some sort of exercise that has more of a positive effect on cognitive function than other exercise? And does all exercise impact positively? Or is it, it gets to the point that, look, if you're overtrained, it actually has a negative effect. If we start by assuming that you're a normal person who does a normal amount of exercise. Um, and then we can we can maybe get onto some of the, the, the other stuff the extremes. later. Extremes, yeah. Okay, yeah. deal. That makes sense. The answer is it kind of depends what you're, what you're looking at. So in general, uh, there was a nice, um, a recent uh, meta-analysis, meta-regression, where you take a whole bunch of different studies and you look for like a dose response of exercise on say cognitive decline Mm -hmm. we can maybe just define what what some of the things that we're talking about so um dementia which sometimes which is a an alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia uh, but dementia is basically significantly Mm -hmm. altered cognitive function in a pathological way it's a it's a clinical it's a diagnosis that a doctor would make based on a loss of you know different functions of the brain Mm -hmm. And then on the way down to that, so you know, most people, when they think about their brain function, they're worried about late onset mm. or sporadic Alzheimer's disease, which is a type of dementia. Mm. And that's like more than 95% of cases of Alzheimer's disease, there are, there are um, as like a small genetic subset that is, is, is different. So, so that's the kind of what most people are probably thinking about. And then there's this period of, time over which you slowly lose different parts of your cognitive function and then again there's a period of time called mild cognitive impairment that's another diagnosis a doctor can make where you're sort of on your way to dementia but don't yet have dementia Mm. but then before that you know even before that you know there's going to be some period of decline so there's this Mm. essentially sliding scale over time from like your peak cognitive uh, performance peak cognitive powers and then this is like on average and it's probably in your sort of 20s to early 30s really that's the peak yeah because that's when that's when uh your so in your early to mid 20s is when you've finished most of your again it depends from person to person depending on their opportunities. But that's mm-hmm. when you finish most of your formal education and formal education provides this significant cognitive stimulus that is very beneficial to the brain. Mm. But equally, it's also the time when your brain has finished developing. Mm. Um, mm. Before we reach this sort of peak of development is when you've set down all the white matter in your brain, you know, your prefrontal cortex, which is important for uh, executive function, decision-making, that mm. sort of reached its near, near its peak state sometime in the sort of mid to, to late 20s. So that's probably when all things considered, that's at your, you're at your peak of your cognitive powers. Wow. Then from there on, again, on average, if you look over time, it's, just, it's basically just like a, a decline uh, over time. I don't think it has to be that way, but that's sort of just like looking at population averages. So, so, so that decline, uh, sorry to interrupt, but that decline is because we stop training it? Like the brain, we stop using it correctly or is it just because that's a peak and it's just something's going to be used up and that's it yeah so um we're told it's the latter but i think it's more of the former so Hmm. in general there's this story that you know you have some fixed number of brain cells and then every time uh you don't sleep enough every time you have a few too many beverages right you kill some brain cells and then there's just like this continuous inexorable decline that you can't do anything about mm-hmm. um that's kind of the story that we're told about the brain yeah. even though it's really not true the brain has the ability to adapt and benefit from stimulus over pretty much over the entire lifespan a colleague of mine uh, dr josh Cherknet, who's a neurologist by training. Um, we just wrote a paper about what we call cognitive demand and cognitive function, mm. which basically provides the hypothesis that one of the main drivers of this loss of cognitive function, which can end up resulting in dementia, mm. is the fact that we stop asking our brains to do difficult things. Interesting. Throughout the paper, 
we draw a lot of ties to exercise because that's something that I think people understand and it's something that your audience will understand. If you want your muscles to grow or you want your cardiovascular function to improve, you need a lot of things, but the main thing you need is to stress the system, right? Mechanical mechanical tension of, of the muscles to if you want to get them bigger and stronger, right? Some kind of cardiovascular or other stimulus to the system, you know, some kind of aerobic exercise or interval training, right? You need to stress the system in order to see these beneficial adaptations such that you improve function. And there's this idea that um, you have this response is called demand function coupling, which basically means that the function of the tissue is dependent on the demands that you put on it and mm. demands in a good way, right? You need to stress the system and then give it a period mm-hmm. of rest and recovery mm-hmm. in order for it to get stronger. And, you know, as part of that, you upregulate all these uh, repair processes, you know, autophagy, you start you know, getting rid of any junk that's building up. And the best way to do that is to actually stimulate the system. Mm-hmm. And it's the same in muscle tissue and it's the same in brain tissue. So if we think about how we use our brains in sort of modern Western society, there's this period of prolonged formal education, which is, mm-hmm. you know, good in a number of ways for stimulating the brain and then you know you leave university and and or you know again or you leave school school. whenever you left school yeah Yeah. yeah. um and after that you're like you get a job and you essentially just spend the rest of your life doing the same things again and again and again um right Mm -hmm. uh and those things don't require your brain to adapt to new stimuli to create new connections because it all becomes sort of rote it becomes habit Mm -hmm. um and often we feel busy right like i I could be busy all day but answering emails dealing with admin stuff sitting in meetings none of that's really stimulating our brains compared to say um you know learning complex information information or Mm -hmm. learning social cues and language as, as we develop, as we get older, right? Those are re- things that really, you know, learning motor skills, those mm-hmm. are things that really challenge the mm-hmm. brain. Mm-hmm. We don't do that, you know, once we hit adulthood. And there's lots of evidence to suggest that if we do do that and exercise and movement is one way to do that. Mm-hmm. Lots of evidence that if we do that throughout our entire life or even later in life, if we haven't done it for a while, we can still get some benefits from that because we're creating this new stimulus for the brain. So mine and Josh's uh, idea is that the main way that we can really uh, intervene to improve cognitive function and prevent cognitive decline is just ask our brains to do things again, mm-hmm. which which we don't uh, usually do. When you talk about, I'm, I'm just kind of getting my head around the training of the brain and I love the, mm. the um, demand function coupling and, and how you stress something and then rest and recover. When we talk about the brain and cognitive function and all the different functions that it does, so you have, even if you think emotions or, or creativity and, and stressing that side of the brain, mm. I just, what are some examples that uh, you, you said languages and, um, you know, just learning in general, but if yeah. you were to say, okay, here's a training plan for your brain and we want to hit, we want to target every region of the brain. Are there sort of certain things that you kind of, you, you talk about the, the best areas to train? Yeah, there's, there's two ways to, to approach this. I think there are several things that seem to provide stimuli to the brain that are beneficial from just basic um, me- memory training, uh, you know, mm-hmm. learning something off by heart. So there's a nice study that looked at prospective taxi drivers in London who had to learn something called the knowledge. Mm, I've heard that. Yeah. Yeah. Which is you have to, you have to memorize 25,000 streets <laughs> in a six mile radius around Charing Cross station in, in central London. Wow. And when they looked at people and so they followed, like these people were going to try and learn the knowledge. And then they looked at, at their brains on an MRI scan before, and then two years after. And those who, successfully learn the knowledge past the test, they saw an increase in connectivity um, and structure or improvement in, in structure in, in an area of the brain related to memory, the hippocampus. And you could see it on an MRI scan. Mm. Those who failed to, to gain the knowledge didn't see any changes. And then they also had a control group, which didn't see any changes. So they only saw these changes in individuals who'd managed to acquire this knowledge. And it 
it could be because they studied harder or whatever, but it, it basically resulted in this adaptation in the brain. So just like basic memory, um, memory. memorization. Okay, that's will, one. That's one memory. That's one. Yeah. <laughs> I'll play so memory then, cards with my kids. Good. Yeah, and then <laughs> um, so language is very important. People, right. there's, some, there's some nice um, data suggesting that people who grew up bilingual and particularly those who maintain mm. multiple languages, they have differences in structure and they're potentially protected against uh, cognitive decline. Mm. Um, music, so yes, uh, playing it, playing yeah. an instrument. Um, there's a nice study where, it, where sort of similarly they, they took a scan of, of people's brains uh, there's, and there's this algorithm that's been used in, I think it's dozens if not hundreds of studies at this point called Brain Age, where basically you take an MRI scan of somebody's brain and you just say to the algorithm, how old does this brain look? No way. Um, and what they found was that compared to non-musicians, uh, people who played an instrument uh, had younger looking brains compared to how old they were chronologically, you know, so wow. their brains are younger um, in structure than they are in their body as aged in years. But the benefit was greater in amateur musicians compared to professional musicians. The hypothesis being that for, prof uh, for professional musicians, it's easier, right? It, this is what they do for a job. Yeah. They're just doing the same thing again and again, whereas an amateur, it's harder. So it's more of a stimulus mm -hmm. for the brain and they see more benefit. Mm -hmm. So music is another. Um, then we see a lot of things around um, retirement. So one of the best ways to study the effect of cognitive demand on cognitive decline is to look at how people's brains function before and after retirement. And mm. there's several studies now that suggest the earlier you retire, the earlier you get uh, cognitive decline because you've removed your main stimulus, which is the work environment. And that stimulus can come from a number of things. It could be the job that you're doing, but equally there's um, a social aspect to work that diminishes after you retire. And feeling valued. Is there yeah, something so, about that? Yeah. Yeah. Whole, so there's there's so many things that sort of get baked in into yeah. a job, right? So uh -huh. we can't like isolate one effect, but we also know that if you're socially isolated, you have an increased risk of cognitive decline. Or if you have, but you have if you have good social structure and support, you see the opposite. You see protection uh, against dementia. So there's definitely a you know a social social aspect. Um, you know, meaning, purpose, all that kind of stuff gets gets baked into some of that as well. This will maybe sort of transition us over to talking more specifically about exercise. But there's um, some nice data, uh, again, a, a big meta-analysis that suggested that particularly for preventing cognitive decline, movement with a coordination component has the strongest effect. So all types of exercise seem to be beneficial. Uh, but if there's a coordination aspect, so we're thinking uh, yoga, it could be skateboarding, you know, dancing seems to be the thing that that's really beneficial. And I think that's for a number of reasons. So if you're trying to like create a, uh, a training program for your brain, like how can you tick off as many things as yeah, possible? Yeah. A dance class is probably by far the, the best thing that, that you can do because it has a coordination component. Uh, it includes music and music seems to be mm -hmm. beneficial in various ways uh, for the brain. And there's uh, obviously a cardiovascular component, right? Because you're, you're moving around. But if you take a dance class and then you compare it to an exercise class that doesn't have a coordination component but has the same cardiovascular um, stress or, you know, then the dance class still has more benefit because of the coordination. So coordination, cardiovascular, music, and then there's a social component. Like usually you don't dance alone in a dance class. You might be dancing with somebody else. You're meeting other people. So you basically ticked like all the major boxes. So if you had to do one thing to improve your brain, then a dance class is probably... I uh, love that. And, and, and when you talk about improving the brain or putting off uh, cognitive decline, are you also looking at, if you take a dance class, are they looking at the brain sort of the five hours after and going, it's really lit up and they're more cognitively clear than they were previously? So I don't know if they've done that with dance specifically. The, the dance studies they've done have looked at, again, the structure of things like the, the hippocampus, which is mm. very important for memory and is, you know, specifically always one of the regions that, that get that has, um, you know, either declines or gets smaller, gets smaller mm -hmm. in people with Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then they, in, after the dance class, compared to, say, a control group where they're doing as much cardiovascular work, but not some of the other stuff that's involved in dance, 
they have you know, greater improvements in the structure and size of the hippocampus on an MRI scan after some period of week, like after 12 weeks. Mm. In terms of shorter term stuff, things that have uh, you know more of a cardiovascular, so if, if, if we think about aerobic exercise versus, say, resistance training, there have been some studies that look at um, aerobic type exercise in and around uh, a learning or memory task. So if you have people memorize something and then they have to remember it. So there's one study I'm thinking of the, where they had to remember uh, some word pairs 12 hours after they they mm-hmm. learned them. So they learn them in the morning, then they let these people go and do whatever they do during the day. And then they came back 12 hours later to try and remember them. And then after the the memory component, they also had them do a VO2 max test, which sounds like a great day, doesn't it? Um, what a terrible way to end your day. Um, but what they found was one of the best predictors of how well you remembered stuff during that 12-hour period was just how cardiovascularly fit you were. Wow. So people who were fitter remembered better on average. Um, for the shorter-term stuff, uh, people who exercised within an hour or two of the memory task, they had slightly worse recall. Mm. Um, But people who exercised an hour or so before the recall task did slightly better. So if you want to remember something that you've previously learned, you know, maybe some exercise in the hour or two beforehand, or on the other end, if you're trying to learn something you want to remember later, maybe just stretch out, you know, wait a couple of hours at least until you, until you exercise. So there's, there's some interactions there on, on the short term, as well as globally, you know, overall, um, the fitter you are, the, the better you seem to remember. And related to that, the first time I think we, we ever saw in a study that you could increase any part of the brain um, or the size of any part of the brain on uh, an MRI scan in adult or older humans, right? Because before then, we just thought things just got smaller and, you know, hmm. uh, worse over time. There was a study where they took, I think they were in their mid to late 60s on average, and they had them for a year uh, do two types of training three times a week for 40 minutes. So one group just did walking, brisk walking. And over time, they slowly increased the, the pace such that, they, you know, they were doing a, a nice brisk walk three times a week for 40 minutes. The control group just did stretching for 40 minutes, three times a week. Um, in the walking group, they saw, again, uh, increase in size of the hippocampus on an MRI scan. And that doesn't mean there's more like neurons there or more cells, but there's definitely better structure, at least. Like you can't tell what's making up that volume, but mm. it's definitely getting bigger, which is, in this case, it, it seems to be a good thing. The greater the benefit they saw on that was associated with those who improved their VO2 max the most. So the more your VO2 max improved with brisk walking, uh, the more that improved the size and structure of the hippocampus. And that was also related to how much uh, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, mm. you released during exercise. And this is a trophic factor that gets released uh, by the muscle tissue or from the body when you exercise. And it goes and it supports sort of plasticity and, and mm-hmm. growth and the health of, of neurons in, in the brain. And so that kind of uh, brings us on to the idea that when you exercise, you're releasing things that can then improve brain function and, and health and another thing that does that seems to do that is, is lactate. Really? Um, yeah. Oh, so the, I've the, produced and, loads so, of that. <laughs> yeah. So l- lactate is a, is a really um, good fuel uh, for the brain. The, the brain very happily uses lactate uh, as a fuel. Wow. And there have um, been some other studies where they uh, took individuals and then they had them do I think it was, it was a, this was a pretty strenuous sort of high intensity interval training, like 10 sets of one minute sprints. I I think, uh, uh, you know, VO two max Watts, uh, on the bike, um, either a hundred, like a hundred to 130%. So kind of whatever your, Mm. your Watts at VO two max are, Mm -hmm. you know, some kind of sprint at there, you know, plus a little bit more, uh, you know, with some rest in between. And then they had them do, uh, a test called, the Stroop test, um, which people may have seen before, which is when you have a word that spells the name of a color, but the word is also colored. Oh. And you have to say the name of the color that the word is, not the color that the word spells, oh. and they're not always aligned. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And those who um, so did this test, and then they had a control group as well. After doing this interval training, they improved um, their ability to perform on this Stroop test. How, how long after? Because I'm wondering how much of it is blood flow to the, like the blood is just moving around. Is that anything to do with it or sorry to interrupt? Well, so so um, it was, it was short, it was short, it was shortly afterwards. Mm. Um, so, you know, we, less than an hour. Yeah. Right. And um, the, it could be blood flow and you, and you do, you know, depending on the intensity of the exercise and how long you, you uh, wait afterwards, you can improve blood flow to the brain. Um, and that's probably one of the benefits of uh, physical activity in general is you improve vascular health mm. and you know the, the the healthier your blood vessels are the more you know the better they are at delivering oxygen and nutrients to areas of the brain that need them and there's you know there's also uh, this thing called an, another type of coupling called neurovascular coupling in the brain which says that when an area of the brain is more active it asks for more blood supply because it needs more oxygen it needs more glucose um, in order to do the function that it's doing if you have you know healthy blood vessels, which you know exercise is, is one of our best ways to do that, then you you can maintain that. Uh, whereas if you have you know significant atherosclerosis, right, uh, vascular disease, um, then you 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 can't do that. You can't supply more um, oxygen and and nutrients to areas of the brain that are active. So then you get this mismatch, which is again associated with uh, deficits in in cognitive performance or cognitive health. But one of the things they looked at, particularly in this study that I was talking about, is that it seemed that those who produced the most lactate had the best improvements short term in in terms of their performance in the Stroop test. Fascinating. Fascinating. So there's a lot of other stuff that happens at the same time. So you're also releasing BDNF. You're also releasing ketones in a similar way when you're releasing lactate. So they only measured lactate. Um, but there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's being released, but lactate is potentially one of them. You know, at, at the simplest form, the idea of blood flow makes tremendous sense, right? Mm-hmm. Just getting things moving. But at what point do you start to think, have they seen a demise where people that are, you know, and a lot of my listeners and myself included have been a part of this, have overtrained where you've yeah. taken ab- your body, physical body to absolute fatigue. There, there, there must be a point in which exercise is not a good thing for your brain is that has that been found definitely for acute cognitive performance uh absolutely so there are two sort of streams of studies that look at this one is cognitive function during exercise right so maybe you're on a bike at a fixed uh, watts or you know uh, percent of of uh, vo2 max watts and um then they look at your ability to do cognitive tasks and obviously the harder you're working you know, at some point, your your cognitive function during exercise diminishes, right? Because you're you know you're you're shuttling so many resources, um, both uh, cognitive and uh, physiological, into that performance that you can't then multi, you, you know humans are, are pretty terrible multitaskers, so so you, you 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 can't maintain the same cognitive function, you know, when you're you know at high levels of effort, say above 70, 80 percent of of uh, maximum heart rate, something like that. And similarly, if you say do some kind of sprint interval training where you just like, or, you know, again, it could be some work around threshold or something, and you just like completely bury yourself. Then again, right afterwards, your cognitive function is diminished. Mm. And mm. that, uh, you know, people have looked at lactate as, as one of the things that that's maybe mediating that. So there could be this U shaped curve, in terms of performance and lactate, whereby like a little bit is beneficial, but then like a whole bunch is one of the ways that the, the, the body is telling the brain, you know, we're really spent here. We've used up all our resources, you know, mm-hmm. now's maybe not, not the time to provide optimal cognitive performance. Um, so yes, acutely, both during an exercise and after exercise, you can work hard enough such that it negatively affects your cognitive performance. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm sure you've felt that. Right? Like, <laughs> I've like, felt it for 27 years. <laughs> yeah, like, like, you, you don't, you don't need a study to tell you that that's the case, right? Like I, I certainly haven't done, uh, anything near what you've done, uh, on the, you know, the physical performance side. Oh, you've um, done plenty. Like, you've done plenty, I've mate. Ser- yeah. There, there's certainly plenty of things where you yeah. like, you finish a race or whatever, and that could be a short rowing race or, you know, I've done like 
24 hour uh, ultra ultra distance yeah. triathlons and like you know your brain is just not functioning and like you can just feel it right i, I don't need to, t- to tell you about a whole bunch of studies that, that i, I that. think that honest in all honesty one of my biggest takeaways after i retired was i started just training you know like 40 minutes a morning you know just mm-hmm. to feel good like you said mm-hmm. get the body, body moving and just feeling good put on a bit of muscle and but the biggest takeaway I got was I started to be able to remember things and be able yeah. to have conversations and remember people's names and all of these things that for such, cause I basically was in the sport forever um, since I was a kid straight through that I was like, wow, I've got some brain back. And Laura and I yeah. both laugh about that. It's like, wow, we were kind of stupid for such a long period. <laughs> Not stupid. That's a bit harsh, <laughs> but you know, we, we, it's amazing when you, when you do get to that point of fatigue, I want to, I want to ask you one question that's become a bit, close to me at the moment is, and, uh, is hot, cold therapy. Um, Mm. and I think we did talk about this in one of the episodes, but recently I've been doing a lot more, you know, 20 to 30 minutes in a 180 degree sauna followed by kind of three to five minutes in an ice cold bath. And, and just want to sort of touch on your thoughts on how that can affect the brain and what kind of research is out there doing that kind of work is that i mean i imagine the sauna is a bit like doing physical movement you know it gets the blood moving and body temperature up and everything else but yeah and and i think that's where you know we we have some some evidence for this is that those you know with those kind of heat changes you can you stimulate some of the same physiologic or cellular Mm. processes that you stimulate with exercise yeah so even exposure to cold can activate some, you know, even activate. So one of the things, one of the pathways or types of pathways that you activate with exercise and with heat, unsurprisingly, is a heat shock protein response, which is sort of part of coordinating this cellular response that then results in improved physiologic resilience later Mm -hmm. on. And some of that is actually even triggered by cold, even though it's called a heat shock protein response. Uh, But cold also releases some of the, you know, exposure to significant cold also releases some of the same things that you release during exercise that may improve health and cognitive function. Like Mm. um, irisin is one of the myokines, is one of the molecules released during exercise that seems to be part of the the whole body benefits of exercise. So you can get some of those same processes uh, through uh, exposure to heat, to heat and cold mm. with heat. Yeah. With heat, there's definitely better evidence for say a dry sauna rather than an infrared sauna because a uh, dry sauna where you, you expose yourself to, to quite significant temperatures, you get some of those same cardiovascular responses. So your heart rate increases, mm. uh, you, you vasodilate. So, you know, all your blood vessels open and your heart is pumping faster against decreased pressure. Um, which sort of happens in low level aerobic exercise, you know, similar to like brisk walking and things like that. And it's, there's not many things that, that do that because compared to that, say if you're doing a squat, you know, squatting, then your heart rate goes up, but your blood pressure also goes up. So it's your, your mm. heart is working a lot harder against the, the, um, the higher pressures and that has a different effect on the heart. So, Interesting. you know, there's, there's potential benefits to both. But, you know, th- there can be some benefits to having the heart beat faster, but against a lower pressure system. So you don't get the same sort of uh, increase in size in the, in the heart as you would if you were mm. doing just, just squat training. So, again, it's, it's a different stimulus, but you, you also upregulate some of these same factors that happen during exercise. However, most of the information that we have on, you know, say sauna or cold exposure on health and uh, risk of various diseases is epidemiological, right? We ask people how much sauna they do or how much they swim in the cold. And then we look at their, we look at their health. So it, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's associated, it's like we only know associations. Um, right, right. Certain people have access to those things. Other people don't. Some people have time to do it. Other people don't. And so that, that kind of complicates it. But there's definitely some potential signal that these could be beneficial, and it's probably by because it stimulates some of those same pathways. It's interesting, you know. I uh, I've spent a lot more time this last year doing hot cold therapy, trying to and just exp- self experimenting. Right? There's mm-hmm. tons. You listen to a million different people tell you different things, and but I've noticed with the cold therapy that if I do five minutes in cold therapy and I always finish with like 30 second full plunge, you know, and it's usually mm-hmm. between that sort of 
in the mid 40s, I guess, um, Fahrenheit, which is Celsius. People have to help me out. Um, around 10 degrees Celsius, I think. But if I do five minutes, that affects almost, it feels like my adrenals are shot later that day and the next morning or the next day. Mm-hmm. Whereas if I do three minutes, I'm able to keep back. I can do it every day and I feel good. I feel like invigorated and I always like to think, I say if I've got something that I really want to get done, I do an ice bath before it because that next mm-hmm. window of three to five hours, I just feel fantastic. Yeah. But I'm curious as to is there a potential negative to overdoing that kind of therapy? Because I, I, I've noticed myself that if I overdo it, I do feel depleted. Um, is that a, something that they've ex- researched or? They may have done, but I I can't say I've seen a, a, you know, a study about that. Mm. However, I mean, what you describe kind of makes sense. If you think in the short term, so like a, a shorter exposure where you say sort of like feel, it feels invigorated, right? When you expose yourself to cold, you're going to upregulate um, some of the stress system, right? You're going to re- release uh, like a bunch of adrenaline and stuff like that. And in short doses that, you know, it's going to help, it's going to make you cognitively sharper. It's going to, you know, sort of mm. help you feel, I guess, invigorated, which is exactly what you said. However, if you decrease your core body temperature too much, you often get some of the opposite uh, effects. Like you can feel sleepy or, you know, a little bit slow. Um, and that's fairly normal because like, your body regulates its temperature with ar- with arousal. So uh, as your body d- temperature decreases, then you become less aroused. So there's there's maybe this thing where, you know, short term, you sort of like activate everything and that gets you up and going. But if you really decrease your core temperature, which you can do with exp- extended exper- you know, exposure mm. to cold, then you sort of, you, you end up having the opposite effect. I don't think, you know, in reality, even with like, just like five minutes in cold, it's unlikely that you've created, you know, any issues around, you know, the adrenals or anything like that. I think that's unlikely. Um, but it's, my guess is it's probably just around how much you've altered your core core body temperature, which can then affect how aroused you feel. Yeah. Interesting. It's just something I'm enjoying experimenting with and, and, and how I feel. And I'm wondering how it's going to affect me long term. but it's, it's been an interesting experiment, um, to do the, this kind of therapy. I want, I want to now look at the flip side of sort of the conversation. And, and that is one of my favorite all time quotes. And I use it all the time is from you <laughs> from episode one. And you said, you know, and, and, and it could be slightly off, but basically what you think directly impacts your physiology. And I've used that a bunch. And I love that because it's all about the visualizing and everything else, which I've, mm. you know, really enjoyed doing throughout my entire life. Um, and so I'm just, I'm just curious as to what, how our brain can affect our physiology. How can we, what things can we do and what examples you have of this where people are able to think about something and then have that impact their physiology. So let's start with a few examples. So the some of the best examples that I have, and if people have listened to, to previous episodes, then I may have used these examples previously. Um, but some of the best examples come from the work of uh, a psychologist at Harvard called Ellen Langer, um, who does a lot of work manipulating um, things like clock time and how people think and feel about things and then looking at um, looking at their physiological responses. So uh, one that I think is very relevant, um, you know, sort of nowadays, uh, they took people and they had them uh, sleep in a lab and they had them sleep either for five hours or eight hours. But then they also manipulated the clocks in the room such that people thought they slept either five hours or eight hours, but it was sort of flipped over, right? Yeah, so some yeah, people slept yeah. eight hours and thought yeah. they slept five and vice yeah. versa. Yeah. And what they found was that people who'd slept for five hours but were told they slept for eight hours had no negative effects on, on cognitive function or how sleepy they felt. Um, but the opposite was also true. So if somebody slept for eight hours, but was told they slept for five hours, then it affected. So they measured things like reaction time and asked them how sleepy they felt. So if you think you slept for five hours, even if you slept for eight, it affects your, how sleepy you feel Mm. and, you know, and, and reaction time was one of the things that they measured. So thinking about 
something affecting your cognitive performance will negatively affect your cognitive performance. So if you think, oh, I did this, you know, I didn't sleep well, I'm really stressed, you know, I'm, I'm going to perform badly in this thing that I'm going to do right now, you will, to a certain extent, manifest that um, and you can physically measure it like you will have reduced performance. Hmm. Um, they've done similar studies uh, with genetics where you take people and you have them run. Um, I think there was a, a 30 minute, um, like maximum distance in 30 minutes on a treadmill. Um, it was in, in something in that kind of range. Hmm. And everybody did the treadmill test and then they did a genetic test and then they randomized people to say, you have this um, genetic polymorphism that's going to make you really good at endurance or really, you know, it's going to make you bad at endurance. <laughs> and then, uh, but it was, it was random. So sometimes that was true and sometimes it wasn't true. Uh -huh. They just told people that. And then they had them redo the test and people where they said your genetics mean that you'll be less good at endurance exercise they got worse on the treadmill <laughs> just because they were told that, and that wasn't necessarily true, yeah. right? They were just randomized to be told that. Yeah. So again, and it's like, you can measure somebody's performance. And if you tell them that they will, that they're likely to perform worse, they do perform worse. Wow. Um, and in that same study, they also uh, looked at a different genotype, um, FTO, which is very slightly associated with risk of being overweight or obese uh, in the modern environment. Um, and again, they randomized people to, to tell them what, ab about this genetic polymorphism, whether it was true or not. And when they told people that they had this, you know, risk gene, then after a, a standardized meal, they saw changes in the physiological responses, like which hormones were released, you know, wow. how full they felt. So like, it's not just that you know, you think something that affects your performance, like you can measure differences in the hormones your body is releasing based on this thing that you're told and that you think it's regardless of whether it's true or not. I, I am amazed by those studies and I love those and I'll, I'll put those in the show notes and I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I'm kind of like, <laughs> it's not only what we think, but the impact of what we say to others. Yeah. Right. And what we hear Absolutely. from others and how we take that on board the impact of what we say is so critical. I um, and onto you, you know, the sleep clock one. You know, it makes me think. I got a lot of my friends. You know, they they wear the different um, whoops and aura rings and everything else. And and I've never gotten into that because I kind of I don't want to be told by something how I'm going to feel for the rest <laughs> of the day. And and I've got to the point, And this is the way I get my head around it. As I um. I tell myself that firstly, I don't look at nightly totals for sleep. I look mm -hmm. at my weekly total for one. And then I also know that every kind of two to three months, I'm going to have a catch up sleep where I sleep, you know, like a bear in hibernation. I, I go yeah. for a 16 hour type catch up sleep kind of once every three months. And that's kind of how I've been self experimenting with sleep. But I kind of feel like I hear these guys at the gym and they're, oh, yeah, my sleep score is only 45%. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, dude, get on with it. Life's not waiting for you. You know what I mean? I love that, though. I love those two studies or oh, three studies. I appreciate that. That's, oh, I'm going to have to be careful what I say to people. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, um, so, so th this is one of the reasons why I'm uncertain as to the benefits of, of, of sleep tracking long term. Right. Because, and again, I think this is very individual, you know, different people can, can accept data in different ways. And I think there's a small slice of the population who are like, I can look at this data completely objectively and say, oh yeah, I didn't sleep well last night because of X. And you know, that doesn't happen most nights. So I don't need to worry about it. Right. So some people can do that. Most people I would argue can't. Um, and you know, a lot of sleep trackers aren't necessarily very accurate. But if you wake up and the first thing in the morning that you do is you you check your sleep score, and if for whatever reason it, that data just those data just aren't accurate, right? Or you know, and and it tells you, you had a bad night of sleep, that you know, based on you know randomized controlled studies, says that could negatively affect your cognitive performance for the rest of the day, mm. regardless of how you actually slept. And so that's where you know the the data that we get and how how we inform ourselves with it, I think can have a potentially negative effect. And I'd say the negative effect, the negative potential effect often outweighs any potential benefit because mm -hmm. in reality, sleep 
uh, experts and circadian biologists will, will argue both sides of this. So I won't say that my opinion is is definitive. Some people will will say that you could you could probably ask yourself subjectively, like, how well did I sleep last night? Did I get enough hours in bed in order to get the amount of sleep that I think I need, right? Mm. So if I think I need seven to eight hours sleep and I feel pretty good if I do that, did I get eight to nine hours in bed? I spent eight to nine hours in bed. I feel pretty good this morning. You know, my sleep was probably just fine, right? Maybe that's enough. Um, and I think for a lot of people that, that could be enough. But, you know, it's not super accurate. It's not perfect. It's not you know, compared to gold standard polysomnography where everything is being measured throughout the night, right? It's it's nowhere near as accurate. But, you know, again, the likelihood of that negatively affecting your performance during the day is pretty low. So there are other ways that you can maybe tackle that and and, and still track things, but not be so reliant on this data that, that may cause a, a negative mm. effect. So, so thinking about the brain to physical performance... You know, what, what are some of the sort of the tools that we can use to become better at, at sort of optimizing our brain to have, you know, a positive effect on our physiology? You know, based on what we've talked about so far, the, the easiest thing to do is to avoid things that we know can negatively affect us, right? right? So if you know that the sleep score that you see from your sleep tracker in the morning affects how you feel then you should probably just avoid it right so like removing these negative influences i I think is 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 the first step because again it's sort of skewed by the studies that have been done but there's a greater detriment to a a negative um factor than there is benefit from a positive factor does that make sense Mm -hmm. so if we go back to if we go back to the um the, the treadmill study with the genetics those people who were told that they had good genetics for endurance exercise, on average, they just didn't see any difference in the treadmill performance. They performed just as well as before, right? So they didn't get better because they were told that right. their genetics were good. They just didn't get, it was that the other group got worse if they were told their genetics were bad. So negative influences seem to have a greater effect, again, in, in the, the small collection of studies than positive ones. So, you know, thinking about things that you know affect your headspace such that it 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 might impact your performance Uh, and that could be trackers it could be people um it could be you know other things that you do during the day that you know if they don't go well then they can affect how you you know perform on the bike or in the gym or whatever so i think that's one area to focus on i like that but then the, the other side is some of the stuff that you've talked about and i'm not a sports psychologist so it's not really my area of expertise but uh visualization self-talk you know you can put yourself in a frame of mind that makes it most likely that you'll perform at, at your best for that for that given moment and there's a whole bunch of tools and tricks and yeah uh, people should listen to my uh, friend dr simon marshall he also has a book um that, that covers a lot of this stuff so so that's kind of that's the other side so i would start maybe by thinking about avoiding the negative impactors but there is a whole you know a whole field of study that that shows that you can positively impact performance through you know again uh, things that you are told and the things that you tell yourself no I, that's fantastic you know what's been interesting and uh, i don't mean to bring it back about myself again but i in sport <laughs> i was heavily into visualizing right i would lie mm. on massage tables and visualize the race and i would visualize when i was in training and and what i've noticed now that i'm more in the corporate world and business is word affirmations tend to work a lot better for me in the moment so if I'm going into a meeting where maybe I don't know anybody in that meeting and maybe I've got to give a presentation and now I just write down words and the impact that they have. So I might write, I have my C words, right? I have courage, curiosity, um, what else is there? Confidence. And I just write them down and I feel them when I write them down and then it impacts me and I go in and being bold is a word, you know. And I've noticed that if you say those and you feel them, because you've got to write them down, you kind of it's amazing the impact that it can have when you then just dive into that meeting. Um, so anyway, a little bit of a segue into just an area that I've started, you know, working on in, in this, in this world that I'm in now. I think part of that, which, you know, which is also important for this is, is the routine, right? Mm, mm. So you have some set of things that sort of set you up to perform and a lot of it could be placebo, right? Like this is where some of, of you know, su- like superstitions in sports are very common, <laughs> right? You know, part of it is that 
you're telling yourself that you have set yourself up to perform at your best yeah. you know, by doing these certain things, regardless of whether it's true or not. And probably if it's around superstition, it's probably not true. Um, or and people can come at me if they disagree with me, and that's fine. But there's this definite, at least a minimum placebo effect from doing a routine of things that you feel sets you up to perform and you will perform better because you feel like you've set yourself up to perform. And so for you, right, you have your word affirmations, but, and part of it is this routine that you've created that sets you up to perform mm. and you feel, you know, I've done the things that I need to do to perform better and then you will perform better. Yeah. I've, I've rehearsed. I'm yeah. all about rehearsing, right? I rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. And that's a part of the rehearsal of, all right, now I'm ready. Here we go. Yeah, <laughs> I, I like that. Um, you know, it's funny. I've been having conversations with a few people on our team and um, a number of them all are right into the longevity side. They all want to live to 150, 200. Uh-huh. Personally, I don't get it. I'm, I'm kind of like, look, if I can get to 94, that'd be a great age. I feel like I've nailed it. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know what else. I don't need to do anything else. Do you know what I mean? I feel like I've... I've already had a really great life and now I have kids. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I've got to at least wait till they get to, if they can get into their forties, that'd be awesome. Point is 150 people talk about, they want that. I'm curious as to what you think is possible. First and foremost, if you think this is a real thing, I know there's a lot of conversation, a lot of podcasts out there that they're having this conversation. I'm just curious as to your thought, both on the physical side and then obviously on the cognitive brain side, can you keep, you know, like if you say we're picking at mid twenties, that's quite a slippery slope to 150. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I guess understanding that if you think it's possible and then looking into how potentially we could do that. So do you think it's possible? 150? No, I don't. Um. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> so, so based on, and there are two completely opposing schools of thought here and I will err on, you know, as a scientist, I'll err on the null hypothesis, which is that that uh, what we currently see in terms of human lifespan is somewhere near the maximum of human lifespan. Mm-hmm. And based on, you know, human, how long humans have been documented to live plus, you know, some adjustment for, maybe improvements in medical care and stuff like that. The limit seems to be around 120 years old, plus or minus a few years, something Mm. like that. Mm. Um, And that's not routine, right? You probably need um, a whole bunch of things to align, like um, some genetics and and lifestyle and environment and all this kind of stuff. And being totally pampered your entire life. (laughs) Well, probably probably not because... that's true, that's true. Right. Yeah, you need some hardships to strengthen you. you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Physiological resilience comes through through hardship, right? So so you need some of that. Uh, And you probably need to remain active physically, cognitively, socially throughout your entire life, right? No retirement. You have to continuously be engaged with the environment and other people all the way through. That's probably a, I'd, I'd guess that that is absolutely required. Mm. Um, other people will say, you know, if we tinker with our mathematical models, you know, essentially there's no limit to human lifespan, right? But so far, so it's very possible that we will make some massive biotechnological breakthrough that means that we can completely prevent or reverse human aging. And I'm going to be really excited to watch that field get into that because that's obviously, there's a huge amount of investment into that in, in various different field, you know, arenas. So maybe one day, but right now, I don't think there's any reason to believe that humans will, you know, routinely live beyond 120 years old. Would you want that? Not really. For you, um, for you, <laughs> for you. So, yeah, I think I'm male. That means I'm most likely to die of something heart Stupid. related. Oh, heart related. <laughs> yeah. Or well, young, if I was younger, it would be yeah, it's something stupid. Uh, death by misadventure. Um, <laughs> death by as, misadventure. Which, which I think is the technical term they put on like post. Of course, there's a technical term. <laughs> so, like my ideal scenario is I get into my I don't know nineties. I think that's a good yeah. That's a that's a good yeah. bet. And then I just like drop dead. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Know? 
you know, maybe under a massive deadlift in the gym or something, right? Like it's going to go, so it may as well all go at once. Yeah, um, setting a new world record, world record for the <laughs> ninety-five plus age group. Um, yes, yeah, so, so that that's that's definitely that would be my my ideal scenario as well. Be like independent, healthy, active, engaged up until the minute that you keel over uh, in in your nineties. Like that that to me seems realistic and something that we you know if we fix the whole bunch of things around the environment, people's opportunities for, you know, education and work um, and diet and movement and that kind of stuff. I feel like, and, you know, I feel like we could, we could achieve that for the entire population hmm. if we invested in that, right? There's something that anybody, that we, we could get that for, for everybody. Whereas living to, you know, this hypothetical 150 years old, if it ever happens, it's going to be for like very few people who have enormous resources to invest oh, in yeah, that process, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So I would prefer bring up the average. Yeah, and you've had your turn. I, I get to this point of going, <laughs> you've had your turn. If you haven't got done what you wanted to get done, what are you doing? You're just taking up space. So I'm uh, I'm very much an advocate of, I love the idea that we're going to die because it really gets the most out of me to do something every day. If I knew I was living yeah. to 150 to 200, I'd be so lazy. I'd, I'd probably just like hang around. Yeah, I'd be just hanging around and get nothing you should done. should probably more rapidly trigger your demise, I guess. Exactly. That's, that's yeah. the, uh, <laughs> I know, I know. So th- that's, that's the irony. But I figure like, look, if, if you and I, if we can get to our 90s, that means we've got to be learning a couple of languages, dancing, plenty, learning mm-hmm. new dance moves too, not getting too comfortable with the one type of dance. We've got to be keep yeah. dancing. Um, you know, doing some memory training. So whether that's playing memory cards or I guess playing games like chess and things like that yep, would also be great. Absolutely. Then, well, then we'll be able to die, die doing a, a deadlift for you and maybe some chin-ups <laughs> for me. I think that'd be, a, that'd be a good run, but, but mate, I, this has been really fantastic. I, I just love our conversations. I truly do. You know, I always forget that I've hit the record button. I feel like sometimes I'm just picking your brain and forgetting we're recording a, a show, but I, I do truly appreciate you coming on. But before we go, I, I was wondering if we could, I could just ask you two final questions. And, and one of them is what's the best piece of advice you've ever received? I feel like you you've asked me this before because no, I know not in that way, not in that exact no, okay. way. <laughs> no, but, but it's okay because I'm, regardless, I have a new I have a new answer, which oh, is probably you know actually the the best advice that I've I've ever received, which was from my dad when I was eighteen years old, um, and I'd just gotten my exam results, and the you know, the systems are different in, in different countries, right? But I've done my my A levels in the UK and you get your results and then you'll have an offer from a university that's contingent on you getting certain results, right? And doing well enough in, in, in these exams. Mm-hmm. So I got my results and I knew I was so I, I knew I'd done well enough to go to and take my place at Cambridge wow. to, uh, as an undergrad. Mm-hmm. My dad, who is a, a professor at Oxford, very successful academic. It was either the first or second thing that he said to me, as well as like congratulations, all that kind of stuff. As he said, Remember, this doesn't mean that you actually know anything. <laughs> and what that has sort of instilled in me is that, like, regardless of your successes, which you should celebrate, there's always more for you to learn. And as soon as you assume that you know everything, not only do you, do you become an intense bore to everybody around you, but you completely lose your capacity to grow and improve. Mm-hmm. And the quality of your work will probably decline because of it. So... You know, there's there's lots of different ways that people approach this beginner's mind or, you know, all this kind of stuff. But just acknowledging that even if you really know something, that doesn't mean that you know, you know, everything or maybe even anything, right? There's still a whole bunch um, more to learn. The things that people have said to me that have sort of translated across you know, decades of my work, that's probably one of the most impactful things. So, yeah, I love that because it's just so... Um grounding. It's like just when you think you've made it or whatever else, remember there's somebody better or remember there's more to learn or yeah. like I've always, my brother has said something similar to me once. He said, um, Greg, you know, you realize you're just working really, really hard to rent being the best in the world at something for a very short time. <laughs> and it was like that. It was like, he's right. You don't own being the best. You, you get to rent it for a moment in time. And yeah. if you're lucky, right? I mean, and even then it's questionable. Did everybody show up? Blah, 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 blah. And see, so I don't know. I feel like that's like your dad was right on. I love that piece of advice. What, what about um, 
Is that same piece of advice is something that you'd like to share with other people? Or have you got some other advice that you would say, here's some advice on how to optimize your life? I would say that my best piece of advice is to acknowledge or know that there's probably no such thing as optimal. <laughs> and the, the reason why I say that is goes back to all the stuff that we've been talking about because mm. this pursuit of optimization may, first of all, may never be achieved because we might not even know what optimal is in a given scenario for a given person. And second of all, every moment that you spend thinking about these things that you need to optimize that aren't currently optimal, you're thinking about how you're currently failing or not good enough. And that can be in relation to a whole bunch of things. And so it's, it's important to strive for improvement and progression. But again, something else we've talked about previously is that the journey is the goal, right? Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. process of improvement and you know learning should be the thing that's important, not the end goal. Whereas if you focus purely on the end goal, you can spend a whole bunch of time. So if you're trying to optimize your sleep, first of all, do we even know what optimal sleep is for you at this given mm -hmm. moment in time? We probably don't. Second of all, every night that you have suboptimal sleep, you wake up and tell yourself how bad your sleep yeah, was, yeah. which then negatively affects you. So I think the process of improvement and learning and growth is really important. But I think it's the process that's important, not striving for some optimal state, which you probably won't achieve anyway. Yeah, it's interesting because I've never really thought of the word optimal or optimize the same as perfection mm -hmm. because I've never liked perfection because that, that to me is what you're saying optimal is. I've always thought of optimize or optimal as part of the journey. Like it's like you're trying, I don't know, but now that you've sort of said it, now hearing it from you with your British accent and all yours, now I'm starting to <laughs> reconsider because <laughs> I've always used optimize and optimal just going, yeah, what, what can we do to get to another place? But I, yeah. I, I hear you because I'm all about the journey and all about the process. That's everything. I know you are. Everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, I was talking to my business partner this morning and I just said, look, it's just the destination's a fun milestone to put out there, but it's all about the relationships you create and the remember wins and, and, um, you know, and, and the things that you try to achieve and the day to day feeling valued and blah, blah, blah. Um, for me, that's what it's all about, you know, yeah. and a bit like you, I think both of us have managed to get what society would call decent success. <laughs> but I think both of us would say it's been the journey to get to those little milestones that was far more important. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but um, anyway, mate, this has been fantastic. What, what's next for you? What do you got coming up? Um, yeah, that's a uh, that's a good question. I've, um, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I'm really right. enjoying the the range of things that I do. Kind of expanding into more of this. You know, how do we keep the brain as healthy as possible for as long as possible? Mm -hmm. um, and and in a really and it being really positive, right? There's always loads that we can do uh, for ourselves and and for others. Um, so I think I'd you know just continuing that work sort of academically, but I'd like to write a book um, mm -hmm. about that. If anybody uh, would like to read a book about that, let me know, and I'll I'll let some agents know that there's demand for it. That'll probably help me get a book deal. But do you know what? I'm really enjoying my current journey. So I, I don't really feel too much need to, to, to change it because I think there's a lot more to be done and, you know, it's really fulfilling and a lot of fun. Well, mate, I, I'm enjoying um, being a little bit of your journey, just being able to be on the sidelines and cheer you on and, and just be able to listen to everything you've learned and, and you, your memory is insane. So you've obviously practiced that because I love how you can just <laughs> grab these. I throw questions at you and you're like, bang, bang, bang. I'm like, Wow. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can't do that. I need to train myself up on that. I'm going to get dancing and start learning a language. But, yeah. <laughs> but once again, Tommy, mate, I appreciate you so much and, and just sharing all your knowledge. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was uh, a lot of fun, as, as always. As um, always. Always. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate you, buddy. For everybody else, you can find all the show notes at bennettendurance.com forward slash media. Thanks a lot for listening. If you've enjoyed the show, your support would truly be appreciated. You can visit the Patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice. Don't miss the next episode, so subscribe and be notified. For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit BennettEndurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, here's to the next time. 
and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.